Now, we still have the other two tiles that are in this game, okay? We have the isopod swarm, and we have the lantern fish, and they are also part of the passive uh, category. Now, the lantern fish is obviously hard, and I, like I said earlier, I would not recommend playing with the uh, lantern fish if you've only played this game a couple of times. You should not play with this one, okay? But let's explain how the lantern fish works. First of all, you're going to add one Archaea per uh, predation tag that's adjacent to the lantern fish. So this one is going to produce you lots of Archaea if you have lots of predators surrounding the lantern fish or adjacent to the lantern fish. So you're going to get one per predator that is adjacent to the lantern fish or that at least has this predatory symbol or predatory tag on it. And if you have one that has two predatory predatory tags, well, then that, that's even better, right? That's adjacent to the lantern fish. So you're going to get Archaea based on that. So like here, for instance, here's the isopod swarm. It has two predatory tags, and it's adjacent to the lantern fish. So the growth is, the grow ability, is to add, get you get to add two now to the lantern fish. And so every time, if this was all you had adjacent to the lantern fish, that had these predatory tags on it, then obviously this is all you're going to get per time that you choose to use its grow ability. But what is it? What does this trigger do? Well, um, first of all, you have to spend um, Archaea equal to the amount of adjacent hex tiles. So let's say we had this one adjacent to the lanternfish. Okay, and we had uh, these adjacent as well to the, um, you know, the lantern fish as well. And this is what we had. This is how it looked, okay? There'd be four adjacent tiles adjacent to the lantern fish. So you would actually have to pay four, obviously, to pay. So obviously you're going to do grow again, again so that way you can get two more because of the isopod swarm but then when you do trigger you get to spend the exact amount that's adjacent to this tile and then basically your spending is going to actually just simply transfer these to each of the adjacent tiles one each so basically you're just collecting archaea to spread to the other tiles you have now there are obviously some tiles that could be very useful the isopod swarm is definitely one that could be at least a little bit useful in the sense that if you keep doing the lantern's uh, fish's trigger ability and you can get some uh, archaea onto the isopod swarm via the lantern fish, that is definitely a decent strategy to go for to work and help out the isopod swarm. And there uh, might obviously be some other tiles that this lantern fish can help out a little bit as well. But basically, that's all the lantern fish is good for. And, and some players might even view that as sort of a waste of time. Because maybe they don't, they're not really strategically sure of how that could be very useful to their other surrounding tiles. And so this one is definitely not one that you should go for um, most likely, unless, unless you for sure know how to work with this one to make it more adva advantageous for you. So that's why this is not one I recommend playing with in the game because of that sense. Because it's really only contingent on helping out your other tiles, which may or may not need help anyways. So that's why I decided not to have the lanternfish involved. Now, the isopod swarm is next. And the isopod swarm, this one does not have a growth ability, okay? So there's no real way of getting, um, unless the lanternfish was helping out, and there's some others that might be able to do it too, but if the lanternfish was helping out, then it would have some Archaea on here, and then maybe you could activate its trigger ability once or twice. But this one is very useful only in certain situations, which is another reason why I decided... I I decided that you should not have this in your first few games because this is another one that's contingent on with with certain tiles. What are those certain tiles? 
Well, it's contingent on a couple of different factors. It's contingent on either one of these tiles or that I'm showing you here, or a uh, majority of these tiles. If another player has the undersea volcano and you have this, then it's very advantageous, especially if the undersea volcano is about to blow up, okay? Because it's, it's about to erupt. Or if an opponent has the sperm whale and at least one of your opponents has either the giant squid or the colossal squid, or maybe you have an opponent that has a giant squid and another opponent that has a colossal squid, even better. But it's contingent on how those work. So let's explain how these two work, even though they are technically in the attacking category, the aggressive category of the game. Let's talk about how these work right now and why this one is almost useless unless you're playing with these in particular. To explain that better, like I said, this has no growth ability. It has a passive growth ability. And the only other way you're going to get Archaea on here is with this passive growth ability, which would actually allow you to add five Archaea to the Isopod Swarm if you get to activate its passive growth ability. What? How does it activate, though? Well, the Undersea Volcano can actually decimate other tiles. The uh, Sperm Whale can also decimate a Colossal Squid or a Giant Squid, in the sense that, after all, the Sperm Whale is going to eat one of these two particular predators here. So that's basically how this is going to activate. So once, once the undersea volcano has five Archaea on it, once it has five, okay, it's going to trigger. It has to trigger. It's going to erupt. And once this erupts, then all of the Archaea are then removed from the undersea volcano, and then it decimates each opponent's uh, one opponent in each op each player's ecosystem. They get to choose which one they decimate, but they have to decimate a uh, a hex within their ecosystem. So maybe one player, for instance, is going to decimate their deep vent, and of course the undersea volcano is also going to get decimated. And then let's say another player decides to decimate the colossal squid here. So three tiles were now decimated. So this passive growth ability was actually activated three times. But because, because only 10 Archaea can actually land on the isopod swarm, this is actually how much it's going to have after the fact. Because after all, once again, you can only have 10, even though technically three were decimated. But every time, basically, every time a hex is going to be decimated, every time your opponent you know, decimates a hex, you're going to get Archaea. So that's the only way that's going to get Archaea unless you have a lanternfish nearby or something like that. But that's how the isopod swarm works. That's how it functions. And then when you do have Archaea onto your isopod swarm, then you can activate its trigger effect, which is pay one Archaea. You'll get a shell for your troubles. And there's better ways of getting shells, so that's not that great. But all of the Archaea that is sitting on the Isopod Swarm will then go into your personal supply, which is obviously pretty useful and pretty cool. But once again, it's contingent on uh, the Undersea Volcano doing its job of decimating opponent's tiles, obviously. Now, the basically, the Sperm Well is going to do the same thing. If an opponent has a Colossal Squid or a Giant Squid, when the sperm whale attacks, it's either going to do a lot of damage to your opponents, or it's going to decimate their squid if they have one. Of course, if they have a squid, it's going to decimate their squid instead of getting hit and attacking your opponent's Archaea. Okay? That's what it's going to do. It's going to attack this from your opponent's supply. Or, if they have a squid, it's going to do that instead. And that's what it's supposed to do if they have one of those. Okay? But then, obviously, if that's the case, then the isopod swarm is going to trigger. I mean, it's going to get its act. It's going to. It's going to get. It, it's going to get its passive growth ability, which is going to allow you to add archaea. So then, in turn, you'll be able to trigger its effect and add some archaea to your supply. So obviously, the isopod swarm is definitely a hard one to pull off, and I've only maybe pulled it off twice in total out of five or six games. Now I've only been able to pull this one off twice in total. So it's a really bad move if you decide to go for the isopod swarm. So this one is definitely one you should probably remove from the game. 
unless you've played this a few times. So that's how, basically, how all of the passive um, tiles work in this game. So in the next video, let's go over how the defense tiles work. All right, so for this video, we're going to talk about the defensive tiles and how they work. So these are the only tiles, the only three different tiles in the game that are purely defensive. And so with only three, that means there's a total of six only that are purely defensive. So the chances of you getting more than one of these is slim to none. So obviously, um, you're going to not be focusing too much on defensive strategies in this game because there's just not that many that really work with a defensive strategy. But let's talk about the giant tube worms first and how they work. So the grow ability for the giant tube worms is you're going to get one Archaea per adjacent rock and per adjacent heat. So as you'll notice, the uh, scaly foot snail heel here has one heat and one rock. And the porous rock over here has one rock. So, and that means this is going to get three Archaea. So then you would obviously for the grow add three Archaea to the giant two worms. And then the next time you did it, unless you had more adjacent heat and rock, you would obviously be adding three more Archaea to the giant two worms. Then once you have five Archaea on your giant two worms, then you're going to spend five of them, meaning you're going to remove them and they're going to go to the general supply and then you're going to basically add one Archaea to each adjacent tile. So obviously getting a bunch of tiles surrounding the um, gi uh, giant tube worms is in your best interest because then you're spreading it around and you're not completely wasting all of the possible Archaea you just acquired because you're basically just spreading it around to your other tiles which might have better effects anyways, for instance. And so in this sense, if you had it like this, you could at least get five. And if you had one more, possibly, <laughs> you could get six. So that's basically how the uh, growth ability is going to, that's basically how the trigger ability is going to work for the giant tube worms. But you're also going to get one shell in the process. So you also get to add one shell to your, to your uh, supply here, personal supply here, okay? So that's why I say, in a sense, it's a defensive tile, because you are focusing on getting shells, but it's also sort of like the growth ability of the lanternfish, because you're also spreading um, the Archaean to other tiles as well. But because it at least gives you a shell, we're going to say it's a more of a defensive strategy card, uh, strategy tile than a passive strategy tile. But that's basically how the giant tube worms works. Um, that's basically how that one works. Now, as for the other two, one of them is obviously super easy to understand. I mean, just like, man, is it super easy to understand. This is the easiest tile in the game. Porous Rock here is the easiest tile to play with. It's extremely easy to remember. So for the growth ability of the Porous Rock, you add one Archaea. For the trigger, you pay one Archaea, and you get one shell to your supply. That's how the Porous Rock is going to work. Very simple, very easy. Man, I could do this one in my sleep. And then, ooh, pay it, and then, ooh. I could basically do it with my eyes closed. Um, you know, but, so obviously this one is super easy. <laughs> You're probably thinking, man, I wish they were all this easy. But that's, that's how porous work is going to work. So it's definitely purely a defensive strategy. Now the scaly foot snail here, this one has a little bit more going on with it. First of all, you have this nice little cure cube that you'll keep on this uh, first one first, okay? And then um, you're going to get uh, one Archaea to put here onto your scaly foot snail here. You're going to get one per adjacent heat and rock. And so since there's two rock adjacent and one heat adjacent, it's going to get three Archaea for its growth ability. Now, to trigger its ability, you're going to need to actually spend um, a total of um, four. 
you're going to have to spend four Archaea all together. So obviously you're going to have to obviously once again do its growth ability at this point and add three more unless you've got more adjacent heat and rock. Then when you decide to do its trigger ability, you're going to you're going to pay for Archaea to the supply, okay? You're going to pay it to the general supply and um, then you're going to get uh, shells equal to where this cube was. So the first time you do this, you're only going to get one shell, okay? But then you're also going to move this cube down one at the same time. And then the next time that you do trigger, you're going to get two shells, and then you're going to get three shells after that. And so obviously you can get a lot of shells, a lot of shells, um, with the scaly foot snail. You're going to get a lot of shells. So that one is the best probably for defensive strategies because even though this one will get you a shell every other time, this one is going to eventually get you three every other time. So obviously you can end up with like tons of shells at the end of the game if you had a scaly foot snail around. But that's basically all of the uh, that's basically all of the defensive tiles in the game. So we will continue on in the next video with the aggressive tiles.